Welcome back, everybody. It's your favorite investment strategist, Larry. And today we are talking about how to turn yourself into a top tier research analyst to get any job you want, especially in finance. So if you're currently in college studying finance or you're a professional looking to break into finance, this is going to be the perfect video for you. So let's get into it. Today we're going to be talking about the background of an equity research analyst so that you can understand how you can eventually get there yourself. I'll walk you through how to build up expertise as an aspiring analyst, and then walk you through this model called the credibility and likability formula in job recruiting. And then of course, I'm going to walk you through powerful ways to build up a network with thoughtful outreach and relationship building. Normally, my channel talks about investment strategy week over week. This week's public investment strategy update is going to be emailed to my email list. So if you're not on my email list, make sure that you're on it. Link is in my description below. So with that said, make sure you're subscribed, like this video. There's going to be a lot of value in here and turn on that bell and let's get started. Right before we do, I want to thank our sponsor Weeble for sponsoring my channel for the month of March where they're offering all of my viewers up to five free stocks valued between $27 and $9,700. I personally use this brokerage. It's a very excellent platform. A link is in the description below. All right, let's get into it. I want to start off by saying that you are the most valuable asset in your portfolio. And that means that increasing your own value is going to reap a lifetime of rewards. So what makes a good analyst? Well, if we take a look at some of the top analysts on the sell side in the investment banks, in the equity research boutique firms, we're going to see a page on the internet that looks like this from Yahoo Finance. And most retail investors, when they think about a top analyst, they judge them based on their recommendation success rate and average returns per recommendation. Now, of course, that's a very objective way to think about how they are doing in their career, but I want to help you understand how these professionals got to where they are. And so when you look at this, page, I want you to focus on the fact that a lot of these senior equity research analysts, they are associated with very specific sector expertise. And John, for instance, from MKM on his LinkedIn page, we're going to see that he's spent a lot of his career in the energy sector. And that's how you build serious expertise in an area by finding a niche, by finding a sector and focusing on, on that area until you become a true expert. So here's some observations that I want to share with you that you can understand right away how to start building your foundation to become a research analyst in finance. So successful analysts, they follow one or two sectors very closely with an understanding of how macro impacts these sectors. They see how the past, the present, and the future of the industries they are analyzing will impact their companies in their coverage universe. Now, this is a very important point here, and it's that they've seen minimum of several cycles so that they understand when market conditions are likely indicating peak pessimism and peak optimism. The length of the time in the market is a serious indicator of maturity and your understanding. So if you're an inspiring analyst, you should do your best to immediately find a specialty while being well-versed in how macro, the big picture, can impact those sectors. So I would encourage you to find a sector that you're interested in, find a sector that you're passionate about, and perhaps a sector that you're familiar with. For me specifically, my focus is on technology and consumer discretionary. Now I do follow other secondary areas, but I don't comment on areas that are not my area of expertise. So how do you start to build up this sector knowledge? Well, the first is to understand the reason the industry exists in the first place. Who is the end market? Who does this industry serve? What are the supply and demand constraints? The reason that question is important is that it helps you understand the average selling prices 
in that industry over time. And if you understand average selling prices, you'll also have an idea of where margins and profitability is likely heading. You also want to have a full diagnosis of the entire market in terms of who are the large cap players, the mid cap players, and the small cap players, and how do the companies interact with each other? Is this small cap over here a supplier to this large cap player over here, or are they direct competitors? Those are questions that will help you understand which companies are likely to be here still in five years and which companies are likely going to have their competitive advantage eroded in a couple of years from now. You also want to study how technology and the changing economy is likely to affect this sector and whether this sector is cyclical or does it have any structural attributes. And of course, there's many more considerations. This is just a sample list to think about. Now, moving on to how you build up company specific knowledge. I would say the most straightforward way to understand a company is through its products or services. Do you believe these products are winners in a competitive market? And then you want to observe the management team and their track record of leadership and see do they have the ability to overcome their biggest challenges and headwinds? And are they going to be able to take market share or will they be losing market share to emerging players in the market? And then combining your knowledge with industry and sector expertise, be able to understand when is the next upswing or downswing going to happen in the industry from a structural standpoint. Now, from a broader perspective, I want to talk about acquiring knowledge. I want to discuss knowledge acquisition aka learning. If you're still in academia, I encourage you to read as broadly as possible while trying to maintain depth. You do not become better investors by only reading finance related material. There is a common conception that liberal arts majors bring less value to the table than finance majors. I don't agree with that at all. In fact, I believe that liberal arts majors have a broader perspective of how the world works, of how society works. And therefore, once you train them on hard skills and the technicals, longer term, they might be able to outperform only finance majors who just focused on that specific narrow area. And as an example, when people, they read literature, it helps them understand society. When they read history, it allows them to understand past events. And reading about science helps you to understand thorough experimentation processes and the scientific method. So some of my Patreon members in my inner circle, they ask me, Larry, what are some of the best resources to read to learn more about investing? And of course, I point them in the right direction. But more broadly speaking, messages that I love sharing from a big picture standpoint is read more literature, read more history, read more about science, broaden out your knowledge, don't only focus on finance specific reading. And then from a social and professional standpoint, I would heavily encourage you to meet people from different majors, from different industries, don't only surround yourself with people in finance because the more you understand other industries, other areas of the economy, the more you understand the big picture, and that makes you a better analyst. And the best part is you become a more interesting person because your thoughts and your ideas are a compilation of many different concepts. Now, the next step is how do we get a job in investment management, equity research, or investment banking based on what I've discussed? And this will apply whether you're in high school, college, or already working. Of course, if you're still in college and high school, you need to build up that experience. And if you're already working, let me show you how to do it. I want to walk you through this model here known as the credibility and likability model. And this is a model that I have observed for a long time. And I sincerely believe that success in the job search is a combination of being credible, being able to do the job, but also fitting into that company's specific corporate culture and being likable. Being credible and not having likability is not likely to secure success. And of course, 
being likable but not having any credibility is also not enough to secure success. I would say that having the combination of these two make you a very, very powerful force even in a very competitive environment. Now let's take a look at credibility first. And here's how credibility works. Credibility is often displayed through the Dunning-Kruger effect. And the Dunning-Kruger effect is represented by this chart here, where over time, a person gains more wisdom, knowledge, and experience. But at the beginning, that confidence fluctuates wildly because of his or hers inexperience. Now, what's important to realize here is experiencing these peaks and experiencing these valleys, they're exceptionally important towards the personal growth of a person. If a person gets everything he wants right away immediately, this person's growth is actually going to be stunted longer term. Having setbacks and having instances where you don't necessarily get what you want right away, that might hurt your confidence in the short term, but longer term, it's going to make you a much more competent individual in that area. So in order to demonstrate Dunning-Kruger effect, I would say that going through experiences where you set yourself up for challenges, putting yourself in a situation where you are facing challenges and being stretched, that will allow you to develop as much knowledge and as much experience as possible. So if you're in college, challenge yourself. Do not take the easiest classes. Challenge yourself in areas that are unfamiliar to you because that is going to stretch your thinking. Don't only aim to get a 3.9 or a 4.0 GPA because that is a very shallow strategy that might get you in the door short term, but that's not going to make you a director in that role long term. So in order to demonstrate credibility, like I just mentioned, there's hard evidence. There's also soft evidence, right? Have high GPAs, good scores, and also objective skills, win awards and competitions. All of those areas are great, but at the end of the day, make sure that you're challenging yourself so that you're unlocking your full potential. More importantly, it's also important to demonstrate soft evidence. And what that means is getting letters of recommendations from professors, from employers, having examples of your independent work on blogs through external projects, and demonstrating your ability through leadership positions in organizations as well. That all demonstrates credibility. Deep contributions and involvement in your existing organizations is valued. And the deeper your involvement in any niche, the rarer and therefore the more valuable you become. The way it works is in the market, it's really also just supply and demand. It applies to your skills as well. How much of a skill set is available in the market, that's the supply. How many companies want it and how much they are willing to pay for it, that's the demand. The more constrained the supply, the higher the wages. So if you have developed a niche, if you have developed an expertise, that is going to make you, in economics, called a Veblen good. In case you don't know what this is, a Veblen good is a good where as the price of that item goes up, so does the demand. In other words, even though that item is more expensive, people are willing to buy it more and more. And the reason for that is because it's rare. It's because the supply is constrained. And so if you have a very unique skill, you can expect to be handsomely compensated for it. Now, on the other hand, if you don't have a very valuable skill, then your skills are going to be subject to the natural laws of supply and demand, where if you have a skill that's similar to everybody else's, well, the market will pay you at equilibrium, but really nothing more than that. So having a niche, being an expert in an area that a lot of companies desire, that is the real strategy when it comes to having that niche. Now let's talk about the sell side, which as you know, includes the famous investment banks that you see on this page from Goldman, 
JPM all the way down to City, and then the buy side, the famous mutual fund king, Fidelity, and then famous hedge funds like Bridgewater and Citadel. Let's talk about the job descriptions on LinkedIn on a sell side role. Let's talk about the job descriptions from the buy side role, and then we'll apply this concept of a Veblen good to help you get the maximum chance to get an interview at these companies. Let's take a look here. Okay, in this sell side role for Morgan Stanley, this equity research role, equity analyst, technology focused role, you can see that Morgan Stanley expects a lot out of this employee, a lot of bullet points, okay, a lot of bullet points. But let me share with you some critical thinking. Here on these job descriptions, identify which bullet point is the most niche. In other words, this is where few people know much about, yet the company needs that badly. And this will enhance your edge. So let me give you an example. If, if you look at all of these bullet points and you read them carefully, let's take a look at the first four bullet points, okay? These first four bullet points, I would say that if you are watching my video right now, there's a very good chance that you could do all four of these bullet points. And if you can do all four of these bullet points, what does that say about the competition? Everyone can do this. And therefore, just because you can do these four items doesn't mean you're going to get the job. Now, let's take a look at some other filtering mechanisms, such as needing the CFA, needing three to six years of buy-side experience. Now, that filter is a filter not by niche of skill, but by simply credentialing and by experience. Yes, the CFA is very important. Yes, having experience is very important. But let's think about it this way. If you and I have the CFA and you and I have three to six years of experience, then when it comes to these two bullet points, once again, we are equals. So I don't look at these four bullet points or these two bullet points as distinguishing factors in terms of your competitive advantage in getting this job. So follow this principle here where you are looking for the bullet point that is the most niche, which few people know about, few people are experts in, yet the company badly needs, the company clearly requires which enhances your edge. So in this bullet point, if you can see that there's a note here about ESG data, about cross asset class investment insights and big data tools. I'm going to circle these in red, here, here, and here. Now we can see that these three areas, I can almost guarantee that if you're watching this video, that not everybody will be able to have expertise in ESG. Not everybody will be able to have expertise in cross asset class investment insights. Not everybody has had exposure before with big data tools. Therein lies the opportunity. That's what I'm talking about when I discuss this concept of Veblen good. You become niche, you become an expert in an area that some people may not know much about, but because this company requires it and you are one of the few people in the world that do know those skills, if there are 1,000 applications, you're almost guaranteed going to have a first round discussion because you have something that the company needs. Another example is through this buy side role here from T. Rowe Price and this role Associate Quant Investment Analyst we can see that these bullet points are definitely deeper filters than the filters up here. Every bullet point in this role is not something that most people can do. Some of these items include reviewing academic and practitioner research that's more advanced than you think, building systematic forecasting models, implementing systematic models, implementing custom performance attribution. So it implies to me that if a person has a very strong background in academia, they have published papers, they have a profile where their work is featured in journals, that kind of niche skill, that kind of niche experience hits that bullet point very, very hard in a way that very few applicants are likely to be able to say that they can do. 
And so, like I said, the, the nicher your skill set, the deeper your expertise, the more you really resonate with that specific requirement and that enhances your chances greatly at getting the role. Now, my opinion is this, the more expertise that you have that the company needs but does not have yet, the greater your leverage. So never stop investing in yourself, never stop investing in your expertise so that you be can become that Veblen good. Now, let's talk about the likability aspect of the model because credibility plus likability equals success. Let's talk about likability next. Credibility gets you the conversation, but I believe it's likability that seals the deal. Here's why. Every company has something called corporate culture. Every company wants to hire the employees that they consider to be the best fit. And corporate culture is defined as the beliefs and behaviors that determine how a company's employees and management interact and handle outside business transactions. Now, corporate culture is important because number one, it can help the company be more productive. A more productive company is more profitable. It can also make sure that the employee retention is strong so that company cannot easily poach them. And that gives the company a very strong competitive advantage in the market. So one of the biggest things that financial firms are going to be looking for when you apply to them is this concept known as, are you the right fit? They spend a lot of time diagnosing that. And here's the truth. A lot of companies and a lot of employees have a general framework of what is considered to be good traits for an employee, dedication, confidence, reliability, all the way down to integrity. One more time though, let's think about how unique that level of likability is. Most of you watching my video, once again, have all of these qualities, dedication, all the way down to self-awareness and integrity. Very likely that if you're watching my channel, if you've been following me for a while now, you're most likely highly educated, you're most likely very ambitious, and you most likely have all these common traits. And if that's you, make sure you smash that like button and subscribe so that I know that you are enjoying the content. But back to this, I want to remind you that these are common traits of a good employee. In order for you to be truly distinguished when it comes to being likable, you want to have certain attributes that other people don't. So what makes someone likable to you is actually a science. And we can see here, it's some of it is about personality. And one of the biggest things that people can develop in order to be a little bit more likable and therefore mesh better in company culture is to have an appropriate sense of humor. Not saying that sense of humor uh, used at inappropriate times is the right move, but having appropriate sense of humor, being a very strong listener, being open-minded and not judgmental. These are qualities that bring a person closer to finding success in meshing with that company's company culture and also doing informative interviews to know what the company culture is like will also help you understand how you can be a good fit. Now, let's take a look at several LinkedIn profiles and understand how credibility and likability plays into their personal branding strategy. So this individual here is obviously very accomplished. The credibility is right there in the title. It's right there in the description. Obviously, he has had quite a lot of success in many different areas of his career. But if there is a recruiter that is trying to understand his personality, they look past his experience and they look at word choice. They look at words such as, I love to dig. I can align and lead. I like to educate. I enjoy meeting new people. These strong opening statements showcase quite a bit about his personality and it tells you how his likability factor is probably going to be quite strong if he's at your organization because every organization wants thoughtful thinkers. Every organization wants alignment with values 
and they want people who are mentors as well. So you want to take that next step and develop the skill to understand what kind of qualities, what kind of personalities the companies are looking for, and therefore enact those in your personal brand. It could be on LinkedIn, it could be on your resume. Okay, Tim Peters, he does something very similar here. His profile discusses his credentials, but also talks about his personality showcased through videos. The text is designed to showcase credibility. The video is designed to showcase likability. All right, now that brings me to the next step, and this is something that some people definitely enjoy, some people don't necessarily enjoy this part, and this is networking and the concept of cold outreach. The truth of the matter is, one of the biggest levers that you can pull is connecting with people using cold outreach through their work. I'm gonna walk you through what this means. Anyone who's ever looked for a job before in professional services, in financial services, knows that cold email is a powerful tool. Now, not everybody enjoys doing this, but it is required many in many instances. Let's take a look here. Initial outreaches, just like a funnel, will eventually lead to some responses, and some of those responses will lead to some phone calls, and some of them will lead to some interviews. The key here is to be persistent, but don't just follow a general email template. You want to add a genuine discussion to the conversation. I'm about to teach you how to do so. Yes, you're going to email certain investment associates. They could be, if you're looking for investment banking, they could be investment banking associates. If you're looking for private equity, it could be private equity associates. If you're looking for equity research or investment management, you, you could be emailing those analyst teams. Now, because investment management and equity research is typically published publicly from time to time, I would highly encourage you to follow the research that the sell side firms that you want to work at has published out. So for instance, Morgan Stanley, they published an equity research note on Apple. This is their team here from Katie all the way down to Elizabeth. And in this report, the team discusses what is their outlook on the share price. They discuss their reasoning as to why they believe the share price can get there. They discuss their earnings per share estimates. Most importantly, if you read through their research, it gives you an idea of how they're coming about their process. And if you believe that you have something valuable to add, if you were to contact them looking for an internship, looking for an opportunity, looking for a job, I would not only cold email them and attach your resume. I think they probably receive too many of those types of emails. I think that they would very much appreciate any kind of constructive complimentary commentary that you might have on their research that might make them think about their work in somewhat of a different way. If you have that value to bring to the conversation, there's a very good likelihood that they're going to email you back. If you only attach a resume to a cold email template, there's about a 90% chance that they will not email you back. So as a reminder, they don't just want someone to do the job. They need someone who can bring synergy to the existing team, someone who understands the needs of their department's present and future goals. And when you do thoughtful outreach, it demonstrates that you already have some level of understanding of their work. And while most people in the job market, when they do cold outreach, most of the bankers, most of the investment analysts, they're going to view these emails with mixed feelings. But if you do it in the right way, you could warm up that conversation to eventually be able to successfully connect. This helps you avoid looking like everyone else in the job search so that if you are lucky enough to get that final round interview, you will eventually be that chosen one within the final rounds. Now, our investment community on Patreon can help you become a better analyst and better researcher to land better job opportunities we provide constant exposure to a high quality forward-looking investment research that is going to give you insightful perspectives of the market. We provide you with a coverage universe to start 
building expertise and knowledge across U.S. and China technology names along with consumer discretionary because those are my areas of research. So if you are looking to build expertise in tech or consumer discretionary, my investment community would be highly beneficial to you. If you were looking to build significant expertise in energy or precious metals or utilities, then that's not my specific area of expertise. Those are not sectors that I specifically cover. I do cover macro and general direction, but I don't cover areas such as energy or utilities because that's just outside of my expertise. I also provide macroeconomic research to help upgrade your investment skills so that you know what's top of mind. And of course, any career questions are always answered one-on-one -on -one inside Patreon chat. Members get access to bi-weekly strategy updates. We can see here that earlier this week, I wrote a note titled, Now is Not the Time to Give Up, if you are a long-term investor. And back when the S&P was at that 4,200 level, I reminded our members that long-term investors should be heavily biased towards holding and selectively buying their strongest ideas if the S&P continues to be pressured. I also provide a monthly 100-page investment strategy deck with names in my coverage universe and updating my thoughts on themes that are happening in the market, what themes are likely opportunities, what themes are likely overextended. Now here is another example of what's included in the investment strategy deck. Some concepts that I'm unable to cover publicly on YouTube include my other tactical strategies on other areas of the market. So as an example, we talked about in March how we entered NVIDIA at the price ranges between 220 and 235 to take advantage of market weakness and potentially be able to see alpha when sentiment returns based Based on our macro and fundamental outlook. And of course, I provide guidance during both upside and downside volatility to help you ensure that our members are making the best risk adjusted decisions and not irrational decisions, even when there's extreme fear in the market. Now I want to talk about key takeaways and principles. Ultimately, you must put in the work to become an asset to your current and future organization. And once you're inside the company, do not focus on external opportunities before you prove that you're a top performer in your existing organization. Loyalty is often rewarded. Do your best to avoid shiny object syndrome. Stop caring about what other people think. Your next job will be the culmination of what you can bring to the market. So I hope you enjoyed this session on career strategy, life perspective. If you're new, turn on that bell and I'll see you next time. If you're looking for further life and career direction, definitely watch this video here. And once again, I want to thank our sponsor Webull for sponsoring our channel and offering my viewers up to five free stocks valued between $27 and $9,700. Take full advantage of that in the link in the description below. And with that said, I hope you enjoyed this. Subscribe, turn on the bell, and I will see you in my next video.